Hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Hunter from EXL Events. And on behalf of EXL and the Avoca Group, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on when navigating risk in clinical trials, it's best to mind your CTQs, your critical to quality factors, and QTLs, quality tolerance limits. As many of you know, EXL and Avoca have an established partnership with the goal of providing the industry with valuable information through presentations at conferences as well as webinars like this one. There's just a couple technical things I want to get addressed before we get things started. To the left of the slides on your screen, you should see a Q&A box. If you don't see a Q&A box, click the Q&A underneath of the slides. There's a little menu, a horizontal menu that goes across, and then that box should pop up. Use this Q&A box to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. We'll try to answer as many as we can during the allotted time after the presentation, but we do have a lot of people on this webinar, and it's likely we won't be able to get to all of the questions. So if your question goes unanswered, someone from the Evoca group will contact you following the webinar with the answer to your question. To the right of the presentation slides, you'll see a vertical banner for our 11th Proactive GCP Compliance Conference on March 16th to 18th in Philadelphia. Our webinar speaker today, Chrissy McDonald, is also presenting at the GCP Conference next month and building on today's webinar topic with a talk on quality by design and proactive quality management as a vehicle for clinical trial modernization and ICH E8 compliance. We are offering an exclusive 15% discount for webinar attendees, uh, and you can click directly on that banner for more information. In the same box as the Q&A on the left side, you'll see a speaker bio tab, which provides more information on today's speaker, Chrissy McDonald, who is the Executive Director of Client Delivery at the Avoca Group. Chrissy is the leader of Avoca's integrated consulting and oversees client deliverables, systems, and processes across Avoca. She has over 12 years of experience in the pharma industry, which has touched on every stage of the clinical trials process and has her PhD in biomedical engineering. The final tab in that Q&A box is a tab for handouts. Here you'll be able to access several supporting documents provided by the Avoca Group, and there are several links to previous webinars that will give you some more information on a lot of the topics that we touch on, so definitely check that out. A few days after the webinar, you'll receive an email from the Avoca Group that will include the slides as well as some additional information, and feel free to respond directly to that email with any additional questions that you may have. All right, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Chrissy. Excellent. Thanks, Kristen. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? I got a nice introduction there from Kristen. I am Chrissy McDonald. I'm the Vice President of Client Delivery at the Avoca Group. Uh, before we begin, I'd actually like to share a little bit about the Avoca Group just to give you a foundation for the information that I'm going to share with you today on our webinar. The Avoca Group has been dedicated to improving quality and compliance in the clinical trial execution process for over 20 years now. We do this by helping companies develop and implement quality and compliance standards throughout their organization. So whether through our consulting, our online learning, uh, membership within our consortium, or the diligent vendor qualification platform, or even speaking at events or webinars like today, our mission at Avoca is actually to help companies increase quality, ensure compliance, and improve efficiency so that ultimately as an industry we can get medicines to patients faster. So the Avoca Quality Consortium is an industry collaborative that was established back in 2011 with the shared objective of elevating clinical trial quality and bringing the key stakeholders in the clinical trial process within greater alignment and ultimately to reduce some of the silos within clinical trial execution. Shown here are the names and logos of a couple of our member companies. At this point, we have 115 in total. And one of the benefits of membership is that there is company-wide access to an online knowledge center, which contains leading practices, guidelines, templates, and fit-for-purpose tools for operationalizing clinical trials in a quality and risk-based approach. So if you don't see your company's name on this slide, um, 
you can contact us about membership or ultimately if you do see your company's name on this slide but don't know how to access the Knowledge Center, again, please reach out to us after today's webinar and we can make sure that you do get access to all of those materials. So today our goal is actually to focus on the overview of the approved ICH E6R2 objectives an overview of the soon to be implemented ICH E8R1 regulatory objectives, and to define some of the alphabet soup of CTQs and QTLs, um, and lastly discuss how these items can be interrelated. Uh, just so you know, as Kristen said, we will be taking questions at the end, but if we run out of time or don't have the opportunity to get to your questions, we will answer those offline and distribute to those who are registered to participate today. So please keep that in mind. So to start off today, and just a quick practice with our polling capabilities, let's start with a simple, what type of organization do you work for so that we can determine the audience that we have here? So do you work for a pharmaceutical company or a biotech, a CRO, a site or an investigator? Are you a consultant? or a clinical service provider, vendor, or other. All right, it actually looks like our results are coming in. And in terms of what type of organization you work for, we have about 64% or 65% of the participants today are from a sponsor company, 13% from a CRO, 8% are a site or an investigator, 7% consultants, and 5% others. So this is great. This is a great distribution to really have this discussion. So one more question to consider here. What size do you consider your company? Do you think you are small, medium, or large? All right, those, keep those responses coming in here. Excellent, excellent. This is great. Okay, we're going to close this down here, uh, and we'll we'll be doing more polling throughout. So now that we've had some good practice here, it looks like we have a nice distribution. We have about 49% of the participants today from a small organization, about 31% from a medium, and 18% from a large. So this will be a nice distribution of questions to really see how these new regulatory requirements and changes affect different size organizations, if at all. So in terms of ICH E6R2, we should all be familiar at this point in time, but after 20 years, there were quite a few drastic changes to the guidance and ultimately what is required for executing a clinical trial. ICH E6R2 had a focus on quality management and incorporating quality by design by minimizing risk through planning and focusing on the ability to measure and mitigate issues at the first detection of a signal. Ultimately, by doing that, there's the expectation that you're conducting routine risk reviews and investigating the root cause of emergent problems as part of the corrective actions. In doing so, it requires the use of data and pre-established quality tolerance limits, which we know is the focus of today's discussion, to assist with decision making that's relevant to patient safety and data integrity. The guidance for R2 also, also stresses the importance of risk-based strategies in order to provide oversight that's commensurate with the risks that matter, to document the rationale for that chosen strategy, and to show reports of following the chosen strategy, which indicates a responsive and ultimately a dynamic system of oversight versus the static or firefighting system of oversight that we frequently see within the industry today. And lastly, the guidance encourages the use of risk-based monitoring, risk-based oversight. So an example is providing the appropriate oversight aligned to the vendor. For an example of this, a CRO executing the entire clinical trial on the sponsor's behalf would require significantly more oversight than, say, a clinical service provider that's providing translation services in a country that's mainly English speaking. So, and another, another important and specific call out in ICHG 6R2 is that ultimately the sponsor and the investigator are going to retain that responsibility of quality and 
patient safety and data integrity. So therefore, regardless of how the trial is outsourced, the sponsor is going to be responsible for that conduct. So prior to ICHE6R2, the industry was mainly paper-based, as we know, and ICHE6R2 called out the use of electronic systems, such as EDC, as a preferred method of clinical trial conduct and requiring validation and quality control of these systems that are used to collect data throughout the clinical trial process. In addition, there was explicit guidance that, or guidelines that was provided for serious breaches, noting that sponsors are required to inform regulators where warranted by local authorities when noncompliance is a serious breach of protocol or ultimately good clinical practice. And the last item that was updated with R2 was regarding essential records. So there was a reiteration of the traditional expectations of documents in the TMF complying with ALCOA, except this time there was an additional C added at the end, which stands for completeness. So the ex expectation is that those documents within the TMF are also complete. In addition, it notes that some documents which are previously not deemed essential are now going to be considered as such. So these documents are things like a risk review or a risk management plan that dictates how the risks are going to be reviewed and acted upon throughout the trial. So that expectation is that that chosen risk management method for the trial is documented within the CSR as well as the quality tolerance limits and any deviations from them. So now we've got a little bit of a background on what these requirements are for ICHE 6R2 and knowing that it is now implemented in full effect, we want to know what extent, to what extent your organization has taken steps to be ICHE 6R2 compliant. So are you currently 100% compliant? Have you done a great deal of work and you're almost there? Do you need to know or do you know what needs to happen but haven't made the move yet or ultimately is your organization unaware of any revision that's occurred? So go ahead and take a moment and select your response here. We're going to move through to close this. So about 7% of you on the phone today are 100% compliant and to that I say congratulations. That is fantastic. Um, there's about 72%, and this is typically what we see across the organization or across the industry um, when we're out speaking, when we're doing um, consulting work, et cetera, that about 72% have done a great deal and are almost there. 16% uh, say that they, they know what needs to happen but haven't yet made the move. And there's three of you out there that were not aware of an ICH E6. Revision. So that's a, a very interesting distribution. Um, and at some point, you know, we should and we can have that discussion about, you know, how and why the difficulties are there in implementing that. We get a lot of feedback on it's it's very much a organizational change management and really changing behaviors that are the cause of of difficulties in, in implementing ICHE six R two changes. But now that we've discussed that, I think it's actually important to talk about ICHE8R1 and different from ICHE6R2 in that R1 is actually still in draft format. So the expectation is, is not that you are fully compliant yet, but I think it's important to look at some of the important changes that are noted in this revision or the draft revision. So there's general principles that are noted within the revision, such as the confidentiality of information and the expectation that the, the identity of these subjects should be protected. It again, like R2, discusses quality by design in clinical research and also notes that study design and objectives can and should differ across different types of studies. So there's the expectation that we are not doing a uniform cookie cutter study design and objective based on, you know, just what we're used to. It should really be critical thinking and design based on, you know, what your your goals are for that product and the patients that are participating. And lastly, in terms of the patients, this guidance explicitly calls out a request that patient input into study design is desired. <clears throat> 
In terms of designing quality into clinical studies, the guidance goes into further detail than ICHE 6R2 and notes that quality should be the primary consideration in the design, planning, conduct, and analysis of a clinical study, and that, again, the prospective quality approaches are desired versus the retrospective documentation, checking, monitoring, auditing, or inspecting, um, with the goal that we can correct these issues prior to patient safety or data integrity being impacted. It recommends that the best way to go about ensuring this proactive approach is by identifying the critical to quality factors, which are another key component that we're going to talk today. So the, the critical to quality factors are a basic set of factors relevant to ensuring study quality and identifying those proactively for each study. E8 guidance, the revision also focuses on drug development planning and ensuring that considerations are taken at the program level and throughout the life cycle of the study so that similar issues aren't repeated within a program and to ultimately build flexibility into study planning. Lastly, the uh, guidance wants sponsors and investigators to ensure that special populations and study feasibility are ultimately considered as important issues to address and focus on during the planning phase. It also discusses some key design elements for clinical studies that can impact the validity of a trial, such as the population, the intervention, the control group, response variable, bias reduction, and statistical analysis. So similar to ICHE 6R2, the E8R1 guidance also discusses conduct and reporting in the clinical study report should be adequately documented. And clinical trial registration promotes transparency and public access to the data. It also notes the importance of protocol adherence, training, data management, and access to that interim data as well as safety monitoring, withdrawal criteria, and data monitoring committees where necessary. And lastly, the guidance is very helpful in that while discussing considerations for identifying critical to quality factors, it actually includes an example list of considerations to utilize when identifying critical to quality factors during the planning stage. The key is to note that the list is not exhaustive and it certainly is not applicable to all studies. So it encourages an adaptive approach that's thought out and ultimately not a box checking exercise. So it does require some critical thinking there. So similar to what we did for ICHE 6R2, again, I want to know what each of your organizations has done to ultimately prepare for this E8R1 release. So are you 100% compliant and you're prepared and ready? Have you done a great deal and you're almost there? Uh, do you know what needs to happen but haven't made the move? Or were you unaware of any upcoming revision? So go ahead and add your comments in there. And it looks like you guys are getting very fast at this polling here. So that was fantastic. So about 2% of the organizations state that they're 100% compliant. There's 22% of you that said you've done a great deal and you're almost there. There's 57% of you that say you know what needs to happen but haven't made the move, and about 16% of you that did not know that there was an E8 revision out in place. And again, given the draft status of this, these responses don't alarm me or surprise me. Um, it's not yet been released, so at this point I think that this is actually a great distribution here. The fact that people are aware that it's upcoming and have begun to do their gap analyses internally to figure out what needs to happen is, is really a great sign for the industry. So we want to talk a little bit about the alphabet soup here. So two of the key items in each of these guidances focuses on, you know, a couple of, of letters here. So the clinical trials industry is actually filled with a multitude of acronyms, as we know, acronyms that ultimately can change from one organization to the next. 
and deciphering them and making sense of the regulations and understanding the semantics in an industry that frankly often doesn't speak that precisely can be a bit of a challenge. So in our consulting practice at Avoca, we often assist organizations in understanding the regulatory requirements surrounding both QTLs and critical to quality factors. But before we can talk about the intersection and how they relate to one another, we actually have to first come together as one on the definitions and meanings of some of the key words that we're going to use to adequately discuss both of these terms. So we actually frequently hear confusion surrounding QTLs, wondering if they're KPIs, are they KQIs, or are they KRIs? And to define those, key performance indicators and key quality indicators, which are shown in that orange box right there, those are metrics that are important in the conduct of a study or program, but they're related to measuring the performance and quality, respectively. So key risk indicators, which are shown in that blue box there, are actually metrics that are considered to be important to assess the risk during the conduct of a study or a program. So they can include operations data and ultimately other study parameters and variables to be assessed to indicate the level of risk that is inherent within a study. So they differ from KPIs and KQIs in that they're indicators of a possibility of a future adverse impact. So the differentiator between a KRI and a KPI and a KQI is that a key risk indicator is oftentimes a leading metric where the other two are a bit lagging. Um, and it's a leading metric in that it's going to tell you that you're en route to something bad happening and now is a good time to take an action to prevent it from occurring. So if we move to the next slide here and we try to, excuse me here, there we go. When we look at thresholds for metrics, we're actually speaking of key indicator thresholds, which those are typically associated with KRIs and are a value or a limit that's associated with that metric that's designed to be sensitive to allow, again, as we said, the detection of that potential issue. And ultimately, if you reach that threshold, then you can take an action that would mitigate or manage that risk. So in the KRI, or in some cases, but uh, a little more rarely, a KPI or KQI threshold is met, an appropriate action is taken, and that action is often outlined in the risk management plan as you're identifying these KRIs that you're going to follow throughout a trial. So the difference between a key indicator threshold and a quality tolerance limit is that a quality tolerance limit is applied at a trial level variable or a risk parameter. So it's used to assess if a systematic trend has occurred and if action is needed. So for the risk identified within the QTL, quality is considered adequate and no action is needed. But risks that surpass the QTL, quality is actually deemed to be potentially compromised and an action is required. And quality in this sense is defined as patient safety or data integrity and interpretability. So to further untangle some of the terminology, we can look at operational key risk indicators with thresholds versus parameters with associated QTLs. So as we stated, in some cases, a KRI and a QTL parameter may be used with the same trial variable. An example is one that we're showing here. So an example is a study that's looking at the rate of premature discontinuation from study treatment. So the variable that can be measured at the site level is a KRI with an associated threshold and at the trial level with a QTL in that the QTL is set at a level where if it's exceeded, evaluability of the study is compromised because there's not enough patients to meet the statistical requirements needed. So a threshold can be set at the site level, which may be exceeded but doesn't affect the QTL, set at the trial level and ultimately the scientific integrity of the study. So put simply, 
the QTL is a level, point, or a value associated with a parameter that should trigger an evaluation if a deviation is detected to determine if there is, in fact, a systematic issue. So in the previous example, the upper QTL would be the maximum number of patients that can prematurely withdraw from the study while still allowing the study to be statistically significant. If the limit's reached, then a decision needs to be made in that the protocol may need to be modified to add additional patients, or more drastically, the trial may need to be shut down if, for instance, there's not sufficient budget to add additional patients to the trial to make it scientifically valid. Um, but because of the severity of meeting this QTL, what you'll see here on this image is that there's oftentimes a secondary limit assigned as well that would give you the opportunity to take a preliminary action or a preliminary option. So in the example that we've been discussing, you could set that secondary limit at perhaps 50% of the patients that could withdraw with the study still being valuable. And if that secondary limit is met, then you would have a, an appropriate um, action or mitigation in place, whether that be additional training for sites to discuss the eligibility criteria and the importance of selecting patients that can participate in the trial for the duration that's required. So now that we're a bit more aware of the complex definitions that surround some of the measures, we can talk about why CTQs or critical to quality factors and ultimately QTLs, quality tolerance limits, are important. So to put simply, why do we care about QTLs? And it's really because the regulatory guidance says so. So it's outlined explicitly in ICH E6R2, and we suspect and are seeing that we will help be held accountable for those as inspections occur. So while these QTLs seem very new to most people who spent their time much like me in the clinical trials realm. Quality tolerance limits have been around for actually quite a while and historically have been required for good manufacturing practice activities. So inferring limits by which significant actions must be taken to ensure that the manufactured product achieves quality and usability limits. So if after the measurement of the QTL is exceeded, the material is either reworked, trashed, or if it complies with the QTL, it's distributed for use. Just to take an excerpt out of R2 that explicitly comments on this, you can see in section 5.04, the guidance specifically states that the sponsor needs to decide which risk to reduce and which risk to accept. The approach used to reduce the risk to an acceptable level should be proportionate to the significance of the risk and that predefined quality tolerance limits should be established. These quality tolerance limits should take into consideration the medical and statistical characteristics of the variables, as well as the statistical design of the trial to identify the systematic issues that can impact patient safety, data integrity, and reliability of the trial results. So detection and deviations from these predefined quality tolerance limits should trigger an evaluation to determine if, in fact, an action is needed. So a summary here of the QTLs is that they should really be reported in the CSR and the intention of including the risk reporting within the CSR at the end of the trial is ultimately uh, to transparently demonstrate how subject safety was assured and how data quality and interpretability was maintained throughout the trial. So it should be done by examining those predefined QTLs and summarizing any deviations from them. So if we take a quick break here, I want to ask again about these quality tolerance limits. So we spoke explicitly about ICH E6R2, but I want to know, does your organization proactively identify these parameters and their quality tolerance limits prior to the first subject in, yes or no? We'll give everybody one more second here. And it looks like it's about leveled out. And so this is very interesting. So I'm going to share these results with everyone. Um, and despite the responses that we had about um, 
people feeling as if they were almost there for ICHG6R2 compliance, we actually have a majority of respondents say that they are not proactively identifying quality tolerance limits um, and parameters to follow for that. So what I'm supposing is that most people who did respond that they're almost there, uh, what we hear throughout the industry is the setting of these quality tolerance limits is oftentimes the barrier to organizations feeling as if they are 100% ICHE6R2 compliant. And because of the distribution of these responses, I would actually wonder if that is the case there. So while we've discussed QTLs and the importance there, we actually now come to the critical to quality factors. And I'm sure you've guessed it, but why should we care about critical to quality factors? And it's, again, because they're explicitly outlined in the upcoming E8R1 revision. So E8R1, Section 2, well, excuse me, 3.2, states that a basic set of factors relevant to ensuring study quality should be identified for each study. Emphasis should be given to those factors that stand out as critical to study quality. These critical to quality factors are attributes of a study whose integrity is fundamental to the protection of study subjects, the reliability and interpretability of the study results, and the decision made based on the results. So again, similar to R2 requirements for identifying QTLs, it notes that historical knowledge of the drug at the point in development when the study is designed or reviewed will inform the, the identification of critical to quality factors and the processes used to manage them. So critical to quality factors should be identified by the sponsor and other parties designing quality into a clinical study. So an example is the investigator and the patient if they're required to execute on factors that are critical to quality. And similarly, proactive communication of those critical to quality factors and their importance to data integrity, patient safety, and study evalu evaluability, as well as the risk mitigation of those activities associated with these factors will support understanding of priorities and resource allocation by the sponsor and investigator sites. So I'm sure that some of that language sounded familiar. And Section 3.3 again focuses on the fact that the patient input is often necessary in helping to determine the feasibility of the study as well as ensuring that the results are meaningful to the patients. So lastly, this guidance offers a rare glance at providing some insight on how to best implement a process to identify the critical to quality factors. And it ultimately focuses on establishing a culture that supports open dialogue. And that's really because to adequately discuss critical to quality factors, you oftentimes have to have had experience in what went wrong. And if you're living in a culture where talking about issues that have come to fruition and how that occurs, then you're not sharing those lessons learned that can actually help to prevent those from the future. It also talks about focusing on activities that are essential to the study and its primary endpoints. Um, that's to engage stakeholders, um, excuse me, and again, it asks that we engage stakeholders in the study design. And that's because there's the hope that if we engage the key stakeholders in study design, we're gonna be able to ensure a decrease in protocol amendments and ultimately ensure feasibility of the study. Uh, and I guess not only feasibility of the study, but also to ensure that there's a meaningful uh, trial design and the outcomes are, are really what patients are looking for and, and looking to participate. And last but not least, it's again another one of those alphabet soups there, is that reviewing the critical to quality factors is really important to ensure that quality is upheld throughout the clinical trial process. So again, this is not like traditional approaches prior to R2 where you identify these critical to quality factors once, you document them at the beginning of the study, and then you actually never look at them again. Um, it's really forcing the issue that we want to be looking at these critical to quality factors. We want to be monitoring that risk throughout the trial and keep looking at them and showing that we're looking at them on an ongoing basis.
So as we just discussed, identifying critical to quality factors and ultimately the quality tolerance limits go hand in hand. But one of the things I do want to ask now is does your organization proactively identify these critical to quality factors? So yes, and you're formally documenting them. Yes, you're identifying them, but you're not formally documenting them. Or no, you're not identifying them at all. Okay. Responses are slowing down a little bit. I'm going to close this one down. So let's take a look at this, but let's take a look at this in the context of the QTLs as well. So it actually looks like there are, a, <laughs> it's, it's very close actually. So if we look at yes, and we're formally documenting those, which I would argue are the people who are most compliant with the requirements to date, there's about 17%. We have 33% that say, yes, they're doing it, but they're not documenting it. So those are the people that are, that are almost there in compliance. Um, and if we do some quick math here, it looks that we have about 50% that are actually identifying those critical to quality factors, and about 48% that are saying no. So if we go back, that's darn close to previously when I asked if people were identifying quality tolerance limits, there were 42% that said yes, they were doing quality tolerance limits, and 52% that say no. And ultimately, this is kind of where the CTQs and the QTLs go hand in hand, because as you're identifying those critical to quality factors, they really are quite related. So when you identify those critical to quality factors and ultimately the quality tolerance limits, those activities go hand in hand because you can use one as a crutch or as a start to identifying the second. So if we look at this slide here, there's a phenomenal article. It was published by Ann Meeker O'Connell, which discusses a quality by design and ultimately the identification of critical to quality factors. So the image that you see here is actually from that article, and the source is below for you to use when the slides are distributed after today's webinar. But it shows an image of the trial life cycle from draft study concept to developing the study protocol and the associated plans or training that go along with it, to the conduct of the trial, and then ultimately to the analysis of the data, and lastly, the developing of the clinical study report. And with each of those phases of the clinical trial life cycle, it shows how critical to quality factors come into play. And I think it's important to look at that and also talk about how quality tolerance limits tie in there as well. So during the draft study concept and ultimate the development of the study protocol, associated plans and training, there's an expectation that the stakeholders are all engaged to identify the critical to quality factors, where we've defined quality, again, as patient safety, data integrity, and interpretability, but this also notes that we're looking at other important risks. So if we think about other important risks, those can be items that are important to scientifically prove to get the necessary label language or to ensure that your product demonstrates what's necessary to meet the requirements to show superiority to another approved product. Uh, an example is, of that is if you're developing a product that already has a competitor on the market, but you need to show that your product has less side effects than the current product on the market, it's obviously important that capturing the data points associated with those side effects is necessary. So if you're stuck in a situation where that data is perpetually missing, you might not be able to prove that superiority. So that is, while not necessarily patient safety or data integrity, that is one of those important risks that you want to be looking at for the trial as well. But ultimately, while those critical to quality factors and important risks are identified, those are actually prime candidates that should be reviewed for consideration of establishing a quality tolerance limit to those critical factors. So my mouse, there we go. Um, if you can measure it and 
you can apply a metric to those critical to quality or important risks that you have identified, you now have a very, very prime target for something that should have a quality tolerance limit associated with it. So if you look at the next slide, this one shows that during the conduct of the trial, it's actually expected to regularly assess and evaluate the management of risk to those critical to quality factors. So for those critical to quality factors that have been signed a quality tolerance limit, the same expectation is there. So you're constantly monitoring that quality tolerance limit that is associated with that critical to quality factor and ensuring that actions taken if the secondary limit is met or if actions taken or needed to evaluate the risk to patient safety, data integrity, or interpretability if that actual quality tolerance limit is met. Lastly, if you move to that last phase there, which we've talked about quite a bit today, which is the development of that study report phase, as we discussed for QTLs, there's the requirement that we address how those QTLs were established and ultimately why they were established. So this is where you can note that critical to quality factor identification was used to assign QTLs where necessary. And similarly, as both the R2, E6R2 guidance noted and the E8R1 guidance noted, and is also noted here in quality by design, it's necessary to ensure that there's lessons learned established through each of these trials to help build the learnings of critical to quality factors and the quality tolerance limits into other trials and basically modify the factors or the mitigations or the quality tolerance limit that was established based on the findings after of each of these trials. So we want to ensure that we're utilizing those lessons learned throughout. So I think it's important to note that if you look at ICH E8R1 and you look at ICH E6R2 holistically, the requirements are very closely linked and, and really tied to quality by design. So identifying those critical to quality factors, measuring and managing those critical to quality factors throughout the duration of the trial, and mitigating and taking action as necessary, followed by reporting on the outcomes of those methodologies in the CSR, um, are all going to help you comply. And if you can utilize all of those lessons learned for each of those trials when you begin to repeat that process again for another trial, you are really in great shape. So in terms of the intersection between the CTQs and QTLs, there's really a clear focus on upfront planning and proactive response. And if you can do that, you're really winning. Um, so at the end of the day, we can do a quick synopsis of, of what this all means. And before the trial begins, we actually want to ensure we're identifying those critical to quality factors and determining if they're measurable. And if they are measurable, we want to assign those factors a quality tolerance limit. And when we establish those quality tolerance limits, we've talked about this on previous webinars, but we want to be limiting those to about three to five parameters that we can prospectively define and plan for those parameters how we're going to address any deviations that arise from those QTLs. When we move on here, at the end of the trial, we want to ensure that within the CSR we're describing the risk strategy that was employed and providing a summary of the QTLs used as well as any of the deviations that, that were taken and the actions that were taken to support those deviations. Um, and the great news is that if you can proactively manage and monitor these and continue to implement the lessons learned from each study into the next, you're certainly going to be in great shape and really you're going to be winning at that game of alphabet soup. So before we get into some of the questions and answers, I do want to thank everyone for attending today. We know how hard it is to take some dedicated time away from your day-to-day -day activities, so we greatly appreciate you joining us for this discussion. Um, and we hope you took something away from today that makes your job a little bit easier tomorrow. So again, we'll get into some of those questions and answers, but I do want to thank you for joining us today.
And thank you, Chrissy. That was fantastic. We do have quite a few questions that have come in. And just to confuse everyone and, you know, make you want another cup of coffee, we have another Kristen on the line, Kristen Bennett from the Avoca Group, who's going to be helping out with some of those questions. So over to you, Kristen. Hi. Thanks, Kristen Hunter. Um, so we have had some great questions come in. So we will start um, with Chrissy, are there any standard CTQs to consider? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we chatted about this a little bit during the webinar today. But what's interesting about this guidance, and when I say this guidance, I mean specifically ICH-E8R1, is that unlike E6R2, which talks about quality tolerance limits and doesn't quite give much further detail other than that or any recommendations, E8R1 is really phenomenal in that there's actually an, an annex to it that provides some recommendations that are laid out within the guidance. Um, it, the, I think the key here is to note that while there are some recommendations and examples of what they're thinking of when they're talking about critical to quality factors, it does note that they should be adaptive and that the examples that they're showing aren't necessarily relevant for all clinical trials. And so it focuses on it, critical to quality factors being important. It gives some examples and some recommendations, but I think ultimately um, everybody's looking for sort of the magic pill or the list of questions that they answer and check the box. And I, I don't think that that's the intent. So there are some standards and recommendations that you can look at, but there still needs to be that critical thinking and assessment and risk analysis, as well as determining really um, what your organization's risk appetite is in terms of uh, figuring out what those critical to quality factors are going to be for your organization and that study. Awesome. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, another question that came in is, do you consider KRIs are applicable only for studies with an RBM model or also for non-RBM type studies? Yes, that's a great question. So key risk indicators are phenomenal and while extremely important in a study that's using risk-based monitoring, they're also very important for standard traditionally run studies, especially under ICHE6R2's guidance for risk management and risk approaches. So if you do, if you're collecting key risk indicators, that doesn't necessarily have to relate to, again, items that you're doing for risk-based monitoring. So they certainly tie together, um, but there's key risk indicators that you might be looking at, not necessarily just at the site or patient level, but overall. And I think an example that we used during the conversation today was Overall, you might be doing 100% source data verification on patients and their withdrawal rates. However, you do know that if you have above a certain number of patients that withdraw from a study, your study is now not valuable. So that's a key risk indicator that you want to be following, not just at the site level, because if there's just one CRA looking at that, they might have a site that has zero patients that have withdrawn uh, early. But you do need someone to be looking at that KRI level from the study level to say, well, that site's had zero, this site has had 15, and that puts us close to the mark of not being able to evaluate this. So I would say that those key risk indicators are important regardless of the monitoring model that you have in place for your study. Thanks, Chrissy. Should QTLs be defined in the protocol? That's a great question, and we get that frequently. Um, we do not typically recommend that QTLs are defined in the protocol. However, um, we, we state that because while QTLs should not, it, it is not best practice to modify a QTL within the middle of a trial. However, there are some circumstances where you may have finished a, another trial utilizing that IP and you've now gained some insight or information that would be relevant or necessary to change that QTL. So you can change it within a study. It's not recommended, but you should make sure you're documenting the how and the why. But ultimately, we wouldn't recommend 
putting it in the protocol because we wouldn't want a protocol amendment because of a change in a QTL. But that being said, there does need to be a mechanism in place where everyone that is participating in some sort of process in that trial understands what those QTLs are and why they're important. So again, if we go back to that withdrawal criteria, it's a situation where if you are doing your investigator meeting or during your initial training with the investigators, you want to be having constant discussions and monitoring and giving them feedback on where that key risk indicator stands with them so that they know what's most important to ensure that the trial is valid, that patients are safe, and that the data is going to be useful. Awesome, Chrissy, you hit uh, two birds with one stone as somebody also asked if a QTL could be revised throughout the, the study. So thank you for that. Great. Um, yes. and I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I do actually see someone noted about whether the QTL should be included then in the monitoring plan. And I think that's a unique question as well in that, yes, I think it would be a great thing to note in the monitoring plan, but what would also be important to know is does that monitoring plan get shared with the investigator? Because I know that from other conversations we have in our relationship with ACRP, we do know that oftentimes um, site investigators don't actually see the monitoring plan that they're being monitored against. So I think a monitoring plan is, is a, a fine place to have it as long as there's other distribution mechanisms to make sure that all of the key stakeholders are getting that information that they need. Very nice. Thank you. Um, are you aware of any specific health authority feedback with regard to product approval inspections around QTLs? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I can say that I am personally not aware of that, but one of the work streams that we have through the AQC is an inspection readiness work stream, and what we do and have been doing for the past three years now is collecting inspection stories from our members, and the purpose of that is because three years ago, ICH E6R2 is not yet implemented. And so we've been tracking at this point in time to see if inspections are beginning to differ now based on ICH E6R2 being implemented. And we're very slowly starting to get an uptick in people who are raising their hand, if you will, to tell us that they have a post ICH E6R2 inspection experience. Um, to get that. Obviously, we know there's going to be a little bit of a runway for, you know, waiting for trials to be completed after R2 is implemented. Um, but to answer that question, you know, we, we don't have that yet, but we, were, we are on the lookout to, um, to track whether or not that is something that's going to happen as a result of, of these guidances being implemented. Thank you. Um, this one's about study phases. Do you recommend different approaches to QTLs to different phases of the study? So early clinical development versus phase four studies, et cetera. Yes, I think if, if the question is related to when the establishment of those QTLs should happen based on those studies, I think it's that they should always occur in study planning. Um, we want to be identifying those CTQs and those QTLs. If you're asking if the quality tolerance limit would change based on the phase of the study, I think yes, that's definitely feasible. Those critical to quality factors and ultimately if you choose to establish quality tolerance limits associated with those critical to quality factors, those are going to be dependent on the primary uh, objectives of a study and oftentimes the secondary objectives. So that will change based on the phase of the study. Those objectives are going to be very different. So theoretically, those QTLs are probably going to look different as well. Thank you. Um, this is about the regarding limiting the amount of QTLs. Um, you are exceptions possible? It's noted, you know, not more than essentially three to five per study. Would are exceptions possible? That's yes, that is definitely possible. Exceptions are definitely. I think if you have a very complex protocol, then it's feasible that you're going to have 
more critical to quality factors and therefore it can be more than three to five. Three to five is our recommendation because that is aligned with the expectation of what the guidance is asking for and it's looking for those systematic errors that are happening, not random errors. Um, and frankly, it's also to help avoid the confusion because a lot of times we ask uh, member companies or webinars or at conferences, um, you know, how many QTLs are you tracking? And there becomes the confusion that these QTLs are uh, the key risk indicators or the key performance indicator metrics that they're tracking. So if we ask them, oh, are you collecting QTLs, and we ask them how many, they'll say hundreds. Yeah, we have a hundred. QTLs that we're tracking, and, and that's not the case. There's 100 metrics that they're t tracking, and there are thresholds likely associated with them where they are taking action, but there's not the expectation that if they meet that threshold, something has to happen. Um, and a lot of those key performance, and it's why we said earlier that key quality tolerance limits are also ultimately tied more to key risk indicators than key performance indicators. And that's because those those KPIs and the performance of your vendor that you might be tracking, those might not affect the patient safety or data integrity or data interpretability. And I think there's some argument where sometimes they can if there's a cycle time and they're not reporting maybe adverse events of special interest in a quick enough time, that, that performance indicator can sometimes potentially modify into a key risk indicator because of how your protocol is designed. So I think that was a, a pretty long-winded response, but ultimately, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, complicated. Thank you. So I think we have time for one last question here. Understanding it's best practice to establish QTLs prior to the first patient, what do you recommend for ongoing trials that may not have these formula, uh, formula documented? Yeah, I think that's great. And I think that um, it's a great question. Not great that it's not formally documented, sorry. Um, I think it's one of those things where um, the expectations from the regulatory agencies are that you are doing your best and you're ultimately showing that you're doing your best and you're making improvements. So while there might be a finding, um, if, if you take the time to stop what you're doing, not necessarily the trial, but your day-to-day -day activities to really critically think about what these critical to quality factors are, what those QTLs are, and document them. Are you going to get dinged because they weren't done proactively? Maybe. But are you going to show that you made an improvement because you realized that something was there? Yes. And I think that that's always the best that we can do, not only from a regulatory approach, but really from what we owe the patients that are participating in these clinical trials. Because if we can identify those and potentially mitigate a risk that could affect someone's safety or the integrity of the study, which they ultimately um, trust us with, then I think that that is really an important thing to do, not only from a regulatory piece, but really from an integrity piece. Great, and that's a great way to kind of conclude this webinar. Um, so I want to thank you, Chrissy. I want to thank Kristen Bennett and everyone at the Evoca Group for con contributing such valuable content. Uh, we definitely had some questions that didn't get answered. So if your question didn't get answered, expect to be reached out to within the next couple days. And we will also be sending an email out that will include the slides as well as the recorded version of the webinar and some additional information. So look for that within the next day or so. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.